Welcome back, everybody. This is SiliconANGLE and Wikibon's The Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. We're live here in Barcelona, Spain, with exclusive coverage of HP Discover 2013. We're back, fourth year now. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm joined by my co host, Dave Vellante, co founder of Wikibon.org. Uh, our next guest is David Scott, uh, SVP and General Manager of HP Storage, previously the CEO of 3PAR, one of me, that was uh, two years ago. <laughs> three. <laughs> three. Three, three. Um, David, welcome back to theCUBE. It's uh, great to be back. CUBE so. alumni. Uh, it was our, um, our start with HP was three years ago in Barcelona. Amazing. The CUBE started in the hotel, we had that little setup. Yeah. You, you, we were there and uh, now look at us. Look, look at us, and now we're having big parties. Uh, congratulations on your success. Um, you just gave the keynote up on stage with Meg Whitman. Uh, congratulations. 3PAR has been mentioned, the 3PAR component has been mentioned in the earnings call. You guys are, again, as Dave says, the gift that keeps on giving uh, in terms of financial performance and traction. Uh, so give us a quick update. What's happening with the business? Um, and then we'll go into all of and analyze all why all the success. So give the folks an update of, of the recent business update and all the success. Well, we've been going through a transformation in HP storage, moving uh, from our more traditional platforms to what we call converged storage, which is uh, based on modern architectures, our own IP, uh, three-part store serve, store once, uh, our store virtual software-defined storage, all part of that. Uh, and we're on a tear. Uh, converged storage grew about 47% year over year uh, in our last fiscal quarter that we reported. Um, and that shows tremendous uptake by customers for these modern storage architectures. And uh, uh, overall, uh, we're managing to now handle the, uh, the transition as some of our older architectures decline. We actually showed uh, a 1% year over year growth. So we're really pleased. We're starting to see the, uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. So a lot of people say to me, um, John, this is the first conversation that they bump into me at the holiday parties, is three par a one trick pony? And I say, no, I think 3PAR is continuing to evolve and more importantly, within HP. So that, that, that seems to be a question we want to ask. Obviously, the success of 3PAR is uh, you know, obviously well documented and then you know, the acquisition and the continued success. But what is that enablement? Why are you guys doing so well? Explain, explain some of the dynamics going on around how you guys came in and just and created such gravity around the, the momentum of, of, around you, around HP. Well, first, I think HP did a fantastic job of the integration of 3PAR. Um, it really made sure that it protected the value that it had acquired. Um, it, it didn't do anything stupid. Uh, it made sure it took the best of 3PAR and actually integrated into HP. Um, so I think we managed to protect uh, a huge percentage of our, our people. So we kept our core engineering talent. Uh, and that has allowed us to, with additional resources, really accelerate our uh, investment decisions. And, and that has resulted in us taking advantage of this modern three-par architecture uh, and, and delivering it as a, a polymorphic entity. One that can not just have its traditional high-end implementation, but the, the new mid-range uh, 7000 series we introduced a year ago, uh, which is on an absolute tear, and then evolve it into a flash-optimized uh, storage array uh, with the 7450 and um, uh, people like simplicity uh, and that's what the 3PAR architecture is delivering. You know, I've always been, um, always jokingly about polymorphic, always joking about it, but you know, it's a word you created, we found that out last year when you rolled that out, um, but, but in a way it, it is significant, so let's, I want to unpack that a little bit for the folks out there. Sure. Uh, polymorphic is a term that you coined, you know, meaning, you know, uh, single View, single architecture and many storage, right? Or poly polymorphic simplicity was the phrase that you. Well, that was the vision, but it was based on a polymorphic architecture. But well, you didn't invent the word polymorphic. No, well, relative to storage, yeah. Yeah. It's, in the, it's, in the, it's well known biology term. I mean. But applying it from a, trying to simplify yeah. the messaging around what you're doing. So, so talk about um, how that scales up and down in functionality because storage yeah. is, you guys know the high end. Yeah. So, how do you move up and down the performance curve? 
with the, this polymorphic. Explain to the, the, the significance of that, of the movement up and down the performance curve and the interface into that for the customer. Well, I think one of the key elements of a, a, a polymorphic architecture is that it actually has to start, start at the high end. It's got to be a multiple controller architecture because then you can bring that down and if you're um, uh, forensic enough about the process, uh, as you bring it down scale, you manage to lose none of the critical functionality, but you do are able to reach price points or different performance points that can add specific value to different customers. Uh, and that's what we've been able to do, not just with 3PAR, by the way, but with our store once backup architecture, which we've just refreshed as well, another polymorphic architecture that can be deployed in many different shapes and sizes to meet different customer so, needs. So to do that price performance, moving up and down that curve, compare and contrast the alternative. To buy, is it, they buy, customers have to buy different, they were the competitor, different solution points, different interfaces. When you say simplicity, yeah. do you well, mean well, interface? Do you mean? Well, if you just take, um, uh, our major competitor, EMC, for example. <laughs> okay, we'll say EMC. Why shouldn't I? Yeah, just say EMC. But it, it, you know, if you want a tier one architecture from EMC, they'll sell you a VMAX. If you want a mid-range platform, they'll sell you a VNX 2. Uh, if you want an entry-level platform, they'll sell you a VNX E, a different architecture. Uh, if you want to go to all flash optimized, they'll now sell you an extreme IO platform. And of course, they have to have other architectures like VPlex and RecoverPoint to make them all work together. Five, six, seven architectures just for primary storage. What does that storage. mean for the customer? Explain the, what, what kind of well, pain points does that well, make? Well, think it? about five, six, seven architectures, different approaches to training, different approaches to manageability, different approaches to interoperability, replication. It's just more complex, it's harder, it costs more money to operate those environments. So back in the day where there was one, ser one app per server, you know, that kind of made sense. And, and I, you know, I, 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 like to, I like interviewing you because you've got an interesting career. You, you've got a, a technical background, you've done a lot of stuff in servers, a lot of people might not know this about you. At one point, you were in charge of the monolithic product <laughs> within HP, the one that you guys uh, resold from, from the Hitachi. The XP platform. The XP, right. Um, which, at the time, back, back in the day, having this so-called best of breed for each of those opportunities made a lot of sense. And then you left HP uh, and joined 3PAR, and so this utility storage yes. thing emerged. You, you picked that. Now, there were a lot of companies trying to do just that, the whole tier 1.5 thing, all, you know, yeah. a lot of block-based stuff. So I want to go back, so what was it that you saw back then that led you to sort of three par and allured you to, but, and then what's happening now? How would you summarize the big tectonic shifts now and how is HP taking advantage of them? Well, I think first of all, back then in the late 90s, um, when I moved into the storage business at HP and we brought out the XP platform, it really was the world-class platform for the type of IT that was being deployed at that time, what, what we now call a, a traditional IT approach. Um, but even at that time, you can remember the first generation of application service providers, they called them ASPs. Right. Uh, you had some of the, the storage as a service providers, if you remember uh, people like storage networks, et cetera. And it was clear to me that delivering storage and IT in general as a utility service was inexorably going to become the direction that uh, the IT industry as a whole would move in. Um, and so when the opportunity with 3PAR came along, uh, I could clearly see that it was an architecture that could be optimized for this new IT as a service world. Uh, and that's why I effectively left HP to, to go become 3PAR three, three CEO. Now, roll forward 10 years, uh, and that view of the world actually came true. Uh, you had the emergence of not utility players, they're actually called club cloud players, you know, public cloud. Uh, some of them are the managed hosts that allow you to deliver virtualized enterprise uh, applications in a public cloud environment. Some are others are, you know, the public cloud providers where you're building a new platform as a service offering um, uh, people like Amazon, HP Cloud, Rackspace, etc. There was a gap too, uh, new time, like guys like Storage Networks went out of business. Right, before, it was a big Well, a the chasm. reason why storage networks went out of business is that they tried to have this new utility model With using wrong storage platforms <laughs> that were designed, <laughs> platforms like VMAX, or really the symmetric start so starting up. It's just too expensive, work, yeah. inflexible, not agile enough. 
Uh, and that's why we built the three-part architecture. It was to be a tier one mission critical platform for the delivery of IT as a service. Now, rolling through, our first customers were those people who were in that uh, public cloud managed hosting service provider marketplace. But we could also see that the enterprise would have to respond to the emergence of the public cloud by building out their own private cloud services to provide the equivalent agility to their lines of business. Otherwise, they'd be relegated to less and less relevance. Um, and that's where the synergy with HP came back in because as a major supplier to large-scale enterprises, who would want to deploy private clouds, HP then wanted the same technology that these managed hosters were uh, using in the public cloud to deploy to enterprises. And that's why the synergy of the three-par acquisition made such great sense to HP, and you've really seen it translate. We went from $190 million worth of uh, product-related revenue at, at time of acquisition to last year, we completed uh, over a billion dollars in revenue just from a product perspective, not including services. So it's been a really successful transition for HP. Yeah, and there's no way you would have, I don't think anyway, as an independent company, gotten to a billion near, mm. nearly this fast. We I mean, couldn't do it as fast. Yeah. I mean, the, the great thing about HP is it's amazing customer coverage and it's fantastic channel partner network. Uh, and we knew that to really blow out the three-par architecture on a wide scale, having that marriage would make a, an awful lot of sense. So, so let's fast forward because you, you noticed the sort of service provider trends, whether it was ASP or storage service provider, and obviously that morphed into cloud service, and it seems like they're a harbinger of, yeah. of major trends and forces in the industry. So you see what Google and Amazon and Facebook and Twitter and guys like that are doing. It's not block-based storage. Yep. I mean, they have you know, block-based storage, but it's predominantly Initially it was this commodity based storage, kind of interesting to, to hear Amazon say they're going to more customized storage. Right. Like, oh, that'll make David Scott happy, ASICs aren't going to die. <laughs> but, um, but, but what do you see now? Um, what, uh, what are you learning from those large internet players and how do you apply that to your business? Yeah, well, the, uh, you know, the, the, what I call the public scale out cloud vendors, if you think of the, the, the typical, the Amazons, the Azures, et cetera, for, for them, um, at the scale that they're operating, it makes real sense for them to use industry standard technology for pretty much everything that they can do within a computing in, in environment. Uh, and one of the advantages of being HP is as, as that evolution takes place between virtualized enterprise hosters on the one hand, people like the Savices of the world, uh, and the um, kind of public scale out providers, if you like, the Amazons of the world, um, we have great technology for the first with platforms like the 3PAR store serve, but for the second type of provider, our own ProLiant scale out server technology is a platform that they can use too. So for HP, we win either way, it's just with a different product line. For our competitors, people like EMC and NetApp, they will try and position their solutions for the traditional virtualized enterprise hosters, but they have absolutely no play in the public cloud. Uh, and that's an exposure that they don't have, uh, that they have, that HP doesn't. Well, they would, they would say their play is the software defined play as that evolves, and you know, they're smart people and they, they, they see the industry trends too. So let's talk a little bit about software defined. So again, the, the big public cloud guys have always done that software defined thing, sort yeah. of programmable infrastructure. And, and maybe you didn't catch my nuance, so I, I should have been a little bit more clear. At, at AWS reInvent, I was learned in talking to some of the Amazon architects that they've done a 180 on infrastructure. It's not just commodity based infrastructure anymore. They're pushing suppliers to do you know, very much highly integrated, customized hardware, which is, yeah. I, I think, I, I'm not surprised, frankly. Um, you know, we've heard the death of hardware for the last 25 years, maybe more, and it just, you know, at value keeps coming into hardware. But nonetheless, what has changed is the ability to do software defined without sacrificing performance. So what do you see in terms of that software defined meme and, and how does that affect HP? Well, I, I, I think um, in the area of software defined data centers as a whole, uh, HP has an incredibly strong position. Uh, we have software defined networking with uh, controllers that uh, uh, Bethany Mayer, my colleague, have, has deployed. 
but we've also had a leadership perspe uh, capability in what is called software-defined storage in the form of being able to run virtual storage appliances uh, on industry standard uh, hardware uh, and being able to convert that into shared resilient storage infrastructure by clustering those industry standard servers together. So we have that platform develop, delivering already today. And in fact, it's been successfully delivered since our left-hand acquisition as our store virtual VSAs for almost five years now and have 175,000 of them deployed already worldwide. So we're the clear leader, very rich functionality. Now for any second or third tier service provider that wants to build a scale out architecture on industry standard servers and they don't have 50 or 200 PhDs to be able to write their own software layers, this is a really excellent alternative. But by the way, it's also a great alternative for a small, medium-sized business or remote offices and branch offices as well. But turning back to kind of the scale-out world, we fundamentally have this leadership technology. We've now extended it into the backup space. We brought out at last Discover in Las Vegas the store once VSA. And so we think we have real product that is battle-hardened, proven, that we can deploy to a wide class of service providers, as well as these small, medium-sized businesses and remote offices, with software-defined storage. So we're not scared of um, vendors like EMC or VMware coming into this market. And we also have the huge strength, Dave, of our own industry standard server business. What you may not have caught is that uh, about uh, four weeks ago, we announced a program that on every eligible ProLiant server, and even our blades, we will ship a free one terabyte mm. virtual storage uh, appliance license, store virtual. Um, that means that a customer can take three ProLiants, cluster them together, run the VSAs on each of the three uh, servers, and have a three terabyte resilient shared storage platform, and then run their applications side by side on the same physical infrastructure. 60% lower cost, much easier to operate, no skill sets needed. And we think that technology is going to be also applicable in many of the service providers, uh, tier two, tier three service providers as well. Um, set against that, what does EMC have? Viper. Viper, it's a management layer. It's not really software defined storage. They actually went out and bought Scale IO as a platform, still not GA, some point in the future, you know, an unproven technology will be brought to market, a bit like Extreme IO. Um, VMware, uh, they have their v vSAN technology, which they're planning to launch, they've announced, but, but still not GA. So we have this leadership position and we feel very good about it, and we're now able to leverage this massive, you know, we sell millions of units of ProLiance every year. Each one of those represents a potential upgrade opportunity for more store virtual VSA licenses as we allow these customers just to easily upgrade their uh, existing infrastructure. And the moonshot for cloud service providers is kind of interesting as, as well. well. We'll see what the uptake there looks like. But, and I agree with you, Viper, it's very early days. I'm not even sure exactly w what it is yet. Um, well, it's another incarnation of storage management software. Yeah, as I can so see. there's another layer there, but the concept you know, forget Viper for a second, but the concept of being ha having a, a RESTful API uh, where you, whereby you can make a call and manage your storage, whether it's block or, or file or, 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 or object, is, is alluring. Do you see that day coming um, and, and also function, like for example, function that the secret sauce inside the, the three-part ASIC. Do you ever see that going into to software defined and maybe being replaced by some other you know, secret sauce yeah. function. What's your, what's your outlook there? So, so um, first of all, let me um, outline you know, the broad view of how software defined connects to cloud and Great. connects to, to virtualized infrastructure. Because um, if you look at virtualized infrastructure, our converged infrastructure strategy at HP, it's really all about the administrator having control. If you look at the cloud, the cloud is all about the end user having control through self-service portals. Yeah, or the developer. Or right, the yeah, developer. Right. The uh, difference with software-defined data center is now you're able to hand control to the application or some kind of RESTful web services yeah, kind right. of API. So you now have potential admin control, user control, and uh, application control. 
Uh, and we feel that we're in a very, very strong position as an infrastructure supplier in this evolution that includes the software-defined data center. Why? Because to have control dynamically, you have to be able to monitor the infrastructure. You have to take information about the infrastructure. How well is my application performing? And then translate that into dynamic policy change of service levels and changing the configurations of the infrastructure that is servicing that application. You need to have the control of the core converged infrastructure itself. And that is what HP has in service storage and networking and really uniquely positions us to be able to provide huge differentiation in the software defined uh, data center space. Now as far as uh, kind of taking uh, platforms like 3 and moving it into software defined storage, I'm actually a great believer in, in horses for courses as we say in England. Yeah. The right racehorse for the right sure. course. Um, and, and, and fundamentally, 3 has always been built around an a ASIC structure. Um, if we change 3 to kind of use a, a different approach uh, without an ASIC, uh, it would make it far easier to deploy that technology as a software-defined storage kind of implementation. But I have no interest in doing so, uh, certainly in the short to medium term, given that I have the world's leading software-defined storage platform with Store Virtual and our VSA technology. And so our intention is to leverage Store Virtual where it's really designed and then integrate it really tightly with 3 pass Store Serve that may be working in customers' enterprise data centers whilst they commute, commu communicate out with their remote offices. Well, and as well, you're getting unique advantage for your customers and relative to your competitors with the 3 pass architecture. Yes. So until that change or as appears it's going to change, there's no, no reason to mess with that, I understand. I just want to see how we're doing on time, because I, I could go a, a sure. long time with you, but, but before we get into, if we have time, I would like to talk about what you're seeing in, in Trends and Flash, but I want to get a quick business update from you. Since the 3PAR acquisition, 3PAR uh, has been, for a couple of years anyway, was growing at triple digit growth. I think it's now moderated to very high <laughs> double digit growth. I wonder if you could share what's going on there, the, con the converged uh, storage uh, uh, figures and momentum. Maybe talk about some of the growth parts of your business. Yeah, I, I think IDC just released uh, their uh, calendar Q3 uh, worldwide external disk uh, quarterly tracker figures. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we were really pleased to see in the, the mid-range fiber channel segment, the largest market, is that uh, by product family, uh, they reported that the three par platform had grown 261% year over year. Mm. Just an astonishing growth rate. And this is really in response to us creating a revolution in the market a year ago. By bringing out the 7000 series, we brought tier one mission critical functionality down to mid-range price points and affordability. Uh, and that has been taken up. Our channel partners love the platform. Uh, we're not only replacing EVAs, uh, but uh, also going out and taking out EMC uh, install base, NetApp install base, and many other people. So we feel really encouraged by that momentum. Uh, in the summer, we went into the all flash optimized array. We brought out the 7450, 550,000 uh, IOPS at less than um, 0.7 milliseconds. I'm really excited personally that just six months later, we announced, have announced with a pure software upgrade a 60% improvement in performance, up to 900,000 IOPS at less than 0.7 milliseconds. Um, with a uh, very scalable platform, you can support 220 terabytes of all flash in a 7450 now. Um, and that platform matches up with the specs of pretty much any all flash startup that is started from the ground up. But the difference is, Dave, it has full mission critical capability, all of the service, it has the stack. Mm. And so it's an unbeatable value proposition. And so we think we're going to see really strong momentum in that market, especially as we added new MLC uh, solid state disk support that has halved our cost per terabyte. So it's made it very much more cost competitive as well. So, uh, okay, so while we're on flash, let me get your take uh, on what's happening in the, in the flash market. You got hybrids, you got all flash arrays. Um, you, you chose not to go out and, and buy a, f a flash company. Others have, I mean IBM, EMC in particular. Why didn't you feel the need to do that and what gives you confidence that you can compete going forward? Well, it's very simple. When you're looking at optimizing for all flash, you're worried about three things. Performance, endurance, and efficiency. 
Uh, and so when we scanned the three-power architecture, we realized because it was an, a modern architecture that was originally designed, if you think about it, for performance e efficiency, uh, and as a byproduct of the way we approached efficiency uh, with uh, system-wide striping and system-wide sparing, it happened to align itself really well to endurance characteristics of an all-flash array. We didn't have to buy a new architecture. Instead, we could just take the three-power architecture, make very simple engineering changes to it to optimize it for the all-flash world. Uh, and so, uh, the benefit of having a robust, proven tier one architecture apply to all flash optimized uh, is obviously of significant advantage. And if we can match the performance and efficiency specs um, without having to uh, go to a new architecture, that is a great investment protection me message for our customers because it means that they can turn around mm -hmm. and, and keep their three par investment and then just move forward to the all flash optimized world uh, with three par. So I wonder if you could clarify something for me because uh, the perception is, of course, it's, a, it's probably fact, that a lot of the stuff that the three power engineers were doing in the early 2000s was designed to minimize the latencies of, of mechanical disk. Yes. But you're saying the architecture applies very well from an endurance standpoint to, to flash. Yes. Can, can you just add a little color to that and explain that a little bit? Well, what, what we did with our architecture is develop system-wide striping in combination with uh, chunklets. Right. Um, and effectively, that meant that any single volume that we provisioned on a system would be spread over every drive on that system. The advantage of that at the time was tremendous performance, but it was also combined then with a parallelized clustered architecture of up to eight controllers, so you could have multiple access uh, through controllers to uh, system-wide striped systems for great performance, but it also provided, with the chunklet architecture, system-wide sparing. So the system-wide striping and the system-wide sparing reduce the level of impact on the drive technology. Now, if that drive technology moves from hard disk drives to flash-based, you have a perfect uh, situation for flash because you're minimizing the wear and tear on each individual flash drive. Now, we've actually extended that because we went with our flash drive vendors and looked at it and said, inside a flash drive, you typically have a whole load of capacity that the vendors reserve to spare out themselves failed regions of memory. Uh, and what we said is, look, we already have a, if you like, a chunklet-based uh, sparing mechanism. Why don't we create something called adaptive sparing where we'll take over that responsibility uh, and then you can release more capacity so our customers get ve better value. They get more capacity out of a single drive than they do with other vendors' operating system implementations. So, it, 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 ironically, it was fundamental, you're saying, to the flash architecture, not exactly. just the spinning disk architecture. Okay, let's talk about some of the other products that you guys announced this week. What, what's, what's exciting you? I mean, we saw your keynote, uh, we talked about uh, the, the three power all flash stuff but you've got store once refresh and store all refresh. Maybe talk about those briefly. Yeah, I, th I think with store once, we uh, really are blowing away the first generation uh, deduplication based backup system architectures like EMC Data Domain. They're all uh, unicontroller architectures. Uh, two years after we introduced our high-end uh, B6200 with high availability, EMC has still been unable to respond, uh, providing high availability for, for their backup solution. Uh, and what we're doing is steadily extending our speed and differentiation. With the, the latest uh, high-end 6500, uh, we uh, back up 40% faster and we doubled our recovery speed. But competitively, that means that we back up four times faster than EMC's flagship data domain 990 and recover an astonishing 10 times faster than they do. Literally, we can recover as much in a single day as it would take them 10 days. Now, there was some research done a, a while ago by the National Archives that if companies go beyond 10 days in terms of backup, half of them go out of business within uh, a few quarters after that. So it really matters, especially as the amount of data that these companies are storing is exploding. So we have a modern second generation store once architecture which is really adapted to this explosion in human information, structured information, machine generated information that customers are experiencing today. So we feel really good about that, and by the way, the Store Once product line 
in the fourth quarter of uh, last fiscal year grew 70% year over year. So it, it's on a tear as well. Mm. And then finally, Store All was uh, our information retention platform. Uh, again, uh, just like with Store Once, we revamped and refreshed the whole product line with Store All, uh, the new 8000 series. Uh, it can be deployed as a gateway in front of 3PAR or with very cheap and deep storage capacity uh, in its own right. Low cost economic storage for you to use as an information retention platform or an archive platform, but differentiated by its amazingly fast search speed. When you're on scale of you know, 500 million uh, files or objects, uh, it can search at 100,000 times faster. And what we've done is simplified the searching. You can now search on multiple attributes. In the next generation of storage, we have uh, store all, we have increased the density by 150%, 40, U, uh, 40 terabytes per single U of rack space. Um, and the final thing we did with store all, which excites me as part of our hybrid cloud strategy, is that we added this OpenStack interface mm. to it for uh, Swift and Keystone, uh, their, their object and identity service uh, um, uh, offerings. Uh, and those, uh, that capability means that now customers can develop in the HP Cloud or at Rackspace, you know, or anyone using OpenStack, and then deploy safely within their own enterprises if they're hesitant about, for security reasons, about deploying right. out in the public cloud. They get that store all integration yeah. out of the box. Absolutely. All right, good, we get the hook, but um, tomorrow you have a, a, a deep dive breakout session uh, for people who want more information from your keynote today, that's uh, 9 a.m.? Right? 9 a.m., Hall, Hall 8, Romeo 02, I think, <laughs> right, A02. Well, David, always great a Great place to start off the yeah, day. Yeah, why not? <laughs> Thank, you. Right. Thank you, Thanks very Dave. much, really Cheers. appreciate you coming on and sharing your insights as always. Keep it right there, buddy. Thank we'll you. We'll be right back, John Ferry and I, with our next guest right after this. This is theCUBE.